Um, okay, so welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming to this conversation about climate compost. Um, I think I'm just as excited as all of you because this is um, many years in the making, um, something that Bridget and Henrietta have been working on for a long time. Um, and really, yeah, it's super exciting to uh, delve into this new realm of what compost is and also how we can be involved in making it for ourselves. Um, so I'm going to start by, well, Bridget and Henrietta um, are the land gardeners. And as I said, you've been delving into the world of compost for many years now. Um, and you both, you have a cut flower business um, and you're basically soil lovers, I would say. <laughs> um, and then Tim Williams is a farmer down in Cornwall. Um, if anyone has Instagram, Earth Farmer. Um, and he's working on regenerating an, quite a bit of land down there. Um, and it's always exciting to follow the progress. Um, and then Andy is a soil microbiologist at Rothamsted. I think I got that right, right? Perfect. Yeah, great. Um, and so he's here to bring some of the science behind what's happening in the microbial world that we're investigating. Um, and then also we are hoping to have on the phone Nicole Masters, um, who is, well, many of you probably know, she's a regenerative pioneer and she wrote a brilliant book called For the Love of Soil, um, which I highly recommend if you haven't read it yet. Um, and I, I guess I should have said, I'm Abby Rose. I make um, uh, an app called Soil Mentor, which you guys use. <laughs> um, and I also make the podcast Farmerama Radio, um, which is sharing the voices of regenerative farming. So very much involved in this movement as well. So to start, I wanted to hand over to Bridget and Henrietta. Um, and I thought hopefully you can give us a little background to what climate compost is. Thanks, um, Abby. That's really sweet. And actually, yes, um, something that's been incredibly important for the development of climate compost is the use of soil mentor. And really sweetly, Abby, about three years ago when we were trying to measure our compost, actually developed our own little side app to soil mentor. So if any of you are interested, there is a really lovely sort of compost measuring app to it if you're not using Soil Mentor already. But um, Henry and I started um, probably about 10 years ago looking into soil health and, um, uh, and what else did we do? We were growing, <laughs> we were growing um, cut flowers and we decided that um, we needed to, to be able to feed and look after them in an organic way. And so we started going all around the world actually um, training with different people, looking at different ways of making compost. And you'd think it should be so easy, and yet it's so tricky. I don't know. How many of you are making compost here? Yeah, and it seems to be well done, well done. But I mean, it always seems to be that you could make it better. Um, and um, so we kept looking around, and we, we finally found some soil scientists in Austria who we've been working with for the last five years who have been quite strict, they're very Austrian and, and, and they've been quite strict with us about how to do it. And finally, um, we've come across a way of making um, compost that's very m microbially rich. And if any of you haven't touched it, after this you must go and plunge your hands into that white bag over there. And I'm sorry, I mean, it probably will speak a thousand more words than what we're saying today, because once you feel it, it's dense, it's sticky, it's fully digested. And hopefully your compost looks like it, but I probably doubt it does. Um, but anyway. And we, we called it climate compost because one of our real aims with it is to sequester carbon in the soil. Obviously, that's um, a preoccupation of so many farmers now. And you can use this compost to reactivate the biology in your soil to help sequester carbon. So we wanted to raise awareness of the power of compost, which is why we called it climate compost. But we'll also be telling you it has other benefits. Uh, particularly, we're looking at raising the nutrient density of the plants that we grow with it, um, increasing the resilience of the soil both to drought and flooding, and of course, uh, feeding the soil. Um, it, it, you will ask in a moment, is it the end to, to NPK? Well, that's quite a, that's quite a big ask, but um, a big claim. But we certainly hope that it's going to really improve soil health biologically using what you farmers already have on your farm. So basically, you know, I mean, 
all of you are, um, probably don't need to be told because that's the reason why you're here is that we all realize that you know it all starts in the soil and if we can heal the soil then we can grow really strong plants and if the plants are growing properly they're that they're, they're interacting with the soil and getting as much nutrients from it and also pulling from the atmosphere what they need. And so then you don't need, you shouldn't be needing any herb, um, pesticides or fungicides. So basically, if we can do this, you know, we can eat better food and obviously help sequester carbon in the soil so heal our planet. We started off um, as um, organic cut flower growers and we used to grow... Um, uh, uh, in, in conjunction with lots of um, food as well. So we were always looking at the nutrient density of food, measuring um, bricks with a refractometer. And what we found is that if we were putting on fully digested um, compost and growing that way, we didn't have any problems with pests and diseases and we had bricks that went from 2 up to um, a, um, and around 11, 12, um, which meant that the, that the plant was functioning properly. Um, and we're also, amazingly, we, we tested our soils when we first began using the Albrecht method 10 years ago, and we had soil carbon levels of around between 2 and 5, and we've just recently tested them, and it's gone up between um, 12 and 15 percent. So our soil carbon has gone right up. But the great thing is, is now we're also working with Becky from the Carbon Toolkit, who I can see over there, who's not only been helping us with our work, she's also helping Tim, and we're monitoring it to actually put some scientific rigor around what we're doing. So how do we do it? In uh, six to eight weeks, we can turn this, which is essentially uh, raw organic, I mean, raw straw, raw manure, um, weeds, hay, and we can turn this into this. Uh, it's a very short time. Uh, it's remarkable. And um, it is really remarkable once you put your hands in it. And the, the scientists have now been backing, up, backing it up as to what actually is in it. Um, this is us, you can see, doing it on a farm. Um, here we, we make long windrows. We turn them with a turner. Um, and uh, over the, la the first 10 days, you have to give it a lot of TLC, really regularly measuring it. But thereafter, actually, it's very low upkeep. So it doesn't need a lot of labor. Oh, OK, this is the teenage picture. Um, so basically, what happens when you put a whole lot of teenagers into a small room? Um, basically, they create a lot of heat. Um, they, um, uh, there's a lot of energy. So basically, you need to open the windows. You need to give them food. You need to give them water. And then actually, oxygen. oxygen. They need lots of oxygen. Um, and then hopefully the analogy stops, especially if you've got teenage children, because you then don't want them to have lots of sex. But actually, that's what you want happening, is a lot of sex and death in your compost piles. And that's what gives all the exudates and all the goodies that actually help to create um, the humifying life in the soil. So here we are creating uh, the windrow. This is brilliant Katie, who's at the back there, who's our key compost maker and um, we're layering uh, carbon and nitrogen and uh, then measuring it on a daily basis um, here you can see this is, um, you can make it on a track uh, but only if you're really somewhere like for example in Sussex where you have lovely chalky tracks um, because otherwise you just don't want it turning into a muddy mess we've we, we've tried that I can tell you we've tried things and tried to cut corners and we've learned from our mistakes um, so you, if you've got a good, hard agricultural track, you can make it outside. And um, you can certainly make it on concrete areas outside. If any of you've got large areas of concrete that aren't being used, then we we'll would love to talk to you because you're very lucky. This would be great for it. Okay, and here you see we've got a lovely little Avant. I don't know if any of you know about Avants, but they're absolutely fantastic for nipping in small spaces. They're incredibly strong, and we have been, what we've found is a really good model is that we're going into farm farms where they've had animals inside over winter, and then we're processing the muck along with um, other inputs, and having a little Avant and Turner um, really works well. We, we did start, they do make bigger Turners, so if you've got nice big tractors, um, you can buy a Turner that will work with them. 
but we found for making um, high quality um, compost that these little turners were brilliant. The big thing, I know there's, and I know there's a couple of compost piles um, uh, near us. Um, the big thing about compost is, you've, as we saw with the teenagers, is you need lots of oxygen. So if you've got a huge pile of compost, which is what where if you see green waste um, sites, they're normally very high, then they're very compact and there's not enough oxygen. The biggest key for these microbes to keep proliferating is you need oxygen. So um, those little turners are great. We, we measure it, as Henry said, and we also, the turners, we add water um, because it's amazing, even in a day, that the, the piles dry out if they're, if they're really active. So yes, what we're trying to do is keep the temperature so that we kill the baddies, but we keep all the goodies. And that is the problem with these big putrefying piles of manure, is uh, you're just, you're, you've just got lots of bad bugs proliferating and not the real goodies. And these were the results. This was at a horticultural level um, where a may, uh, brilliantly the Soil Association asked us to do a trial with innovative farmers and um, using this compost we were just finding that our plants, our flowers just were just going stronger and longer and lasting longer in a vase life, which is why uh, we then decided to go on at a farm level and look at, look at growing uh, crops on a larger scale. And as Bridgie said, in 10 years, uh, we increased our organic matter in the garden from 5.6% to 12.6% in some areas, even 15%. So some of you might know Ian Robertson at SSM. And uh, yeah, he was just sort of, he said it was remarkable. And also, um, they've done a study at UC Davis, a 19-year study with under Kate Skull, and they found that um, the use of um, compost with cover crops was a game changer in sequestering carbon, and that's certainly what we have seen. I mean, you, if you're mixing the compost with cover crops, which Tim will talk about in a minute, there, there seems to be a big difference. Oh, here's the big question. Is this the end of NPK? We really think it is. I mean, it's amazing. Um, you know, the, the thing about it is is that if you can give a balanced compost full of microlife to the soil, the soil will sort itself out. Um, if you give it, you know, a three different um, chemicals that is not synthesized properly, it's, it's, it struggles to really then complete the cycle. I mean, nature is so sophisticated that I think none of us could even begin to uh, even understand the, the, the level of sophistication. And so it's better, we believe, to, to give the, um, the environment things that it needs and let it, it, it do something much better than you know, a synthetic fertilizer. So basically, this um, compost is a key to unlocking nutrients and, um, and basically getting the plant to do all the work for you. I'm sure so many of you know the symbiotic relationship between the plant roots and the soil. But um, by bringing the photosynthesis down, the sugars down, they go out of the roots, they feed the microbes, and the microbes in the soil in return release the nutrients to the plant roots. So um, if we can get that food back in the soil, and we can always have uh, covered areas of soil with cover crops, your, the, the plant plus the soil plus the biology reboots the soil. And... Um we've got these little bags of climate compost, um, which um, amazingly, um, we were gonna sell compost in big, you know, normal looking compost bags until we started realizing that actually what we're making is more of an inoculum and you only need a tiny bit. Now Tim is gonna tell us about this um, and uh, he's using this compost on a farm scale and how to scale it up. And you know, that's always been a point of, a sort of a barrier to us because farmers would say, well, it's all very well, You're, you know, using it on sort of 10 hectares growing flowers. How can we do it on 10,000 hectares? Well, um, uh, what we're discovering is that you actually only need a l tiny amount. So uh, we're selling um, two litre bags, um, uh, for, and that would do most home gardens, and possibly would do, I mean, Tim's going to tell you, but... About a hectare? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is that me? Yeah, so it does about two litres to the hectare is what I'm looking at um, in terms of a compost tea application. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. You don't need much, but you need quality. And it's like everything that's happening in agriculture at the moment. It's not about, you know, high yields. It's about quality um, yields, I think. 
And um, we really want to educate and empower other farmers to do it. Really excitingly, we've got um, uh, a couple of farms that have now teamed up with us uh, where we're uh, making it on their um, farms. We've got Althorpe in Northamptonshire, uh, which is really exciting. We've got a pilot farm with them where we are um, going to be trialling Regen Ag principles and uh, this new composting. So that's really exciting. And we've got our research partners about which Andy will tell you more, but really we want to team up with universities to really get the sort of scientific backing, uh, well, or just really to trial it, for us all to trial how this works, how best to use it on our farms. And I think, I think that's it. I think yeah. that's climate compost. But the really brilliant thing is, is that now we're working with Tim, who is a fellow Kiwi. There's two Kiwis here in the middle. Um, uh, and he's um, being able to sort of s trial, as, as I said, on a scale that you know, might be interesting for most of you. And I think it's, that's, this is going to be the key where we can really make a difference. And what we really want to do is empower all of you to do it yourself. If you can't do it yourself, then maybe collaborate or come back to us to, to get help or to get some of the product. Anyway, here's Tim. So this is me. I'm a uh, regenerative contract farmer down in Cornwall, sometimes advisor. Um, at the moment, I've got two farms under management, side by side. Uh, it's a state, which is a permanent pasture. It's about 100 acres with suckler cows on it. And Earth Barton, which is about 300 acres, and it's part of the wider Antony estate. Um, Earth Barton, historically, has been a conventional arable farm. Uh, for I would say probably 40 years and it's um, potatoes, daffodils, cereals, 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 uh, not a lot of livestock. Uh, so it's been pretty hammered. The soil is pretty devoid of life. Um, there's structural issues. Uh, yeah, it's just historically it's been very conventionally farmed. So. Um, I was approached by Anthony Estate to take this on as a bit of a project. It's about 10% of the wider estate. And just to start trialling regenerative principles, um, it's a five-year project, essentially, uh, to transition it away from the intensive arable into a regenerative system. Um, so I come from New Zealand. Uh, my background's sort of in uh, pasture management, rotational grazing, um, I kind of stumbled upon the regenerative movement about, I don't know, five, ten years ago, um, looking at Joel Salatin and Gabe Brown and people like that, and then stumbled upon Christine Jones and, um, and Nicole Masters. And, um, yeah, so it sort of evolved from there. So this is my setup here on a day-to-day -day basis, a uh, lot of mob stocking, rotational grazing. Um, this is this ground that I've taken on. So you can see the potato ground that was harvested quite late in the winter. Um, and that's kind of what's pretty typical of our area. Um, you can see the thatching of the arable ground that's almost nine months later after harvest. So that's, you can see there that it's actually devoid of any biology. Um, and I would say that's historical uh, chemical use. Um, excessive uh, tillage from the potatoes. It's a lot of compaction, uh, a lot of erosion. Uh, yeah, your typical sort of chemical use, a lot of uh, nitrogen use, and, and sort of we're, we're turning it completely on its head, um, essentially. So the tools for the regeneration of the soil for me, um, it sort of started with mob stocking, rotational grazing, uh, using animals, following that sort of um, savoury sort of model, uh, and then looking at the so the the animals is at the moment we've got about 100 head of cattle. Um, they're mob stocked on about a hectare a day. I could probably do with another 100 because we've got so much grass right now; it's ridiculous. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do with that is to maximise photosynthesis because essentially 
carbon is key, it's critical, and you know, the most efficient way to build carbon in your soils is through photosynthesis. And then secondary to that um, is the plants. So I've put down a 30-way cover crop mix, which is, it sort of transitions over the season, starts off in the winter uh, with a brassica thing, and then grows that with about 500 lambs over winter, and then in the spring, this is what it's come away as. There's a lot of crimson clover in the mix. And it transitions over time. Uh, it's a blend of annuals and perennials. And then eventually it was going to transition into a permanent system. And then we're going to play around, hopefully um, take on some wild farm grain stuff, which is quite exciting. Uh, and then it's the piece in the puzzle for me was the biology. So you can do your mob stocking and do your rotational grazing but to actually speed up that process of getting the biology functioning quickly, um, we need something like climate compost. So that's why it was really exciting to meet these guys uh, at the Oxford Real Farming Conference, was it? A couple of years ago. And we've sort of been keeping in contact since then. And, and you know, it doesn't matter where your soil is. It can be in the garden, it could be in a pot, it could be on your lawn, it could be out in your farm. Soil is soil is soil, it doesn't really matter. So it functions the same. So by applying those principles uh, from a garden scale and taking it to the farm, I think that's, that's the key. Um, so yeah, so this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to achieve biological function because it's the biology that essentially creates, well, feeds the soil, creates soil, uh, builds soil, and that's that energy mineral exchange. But for that to be as efficient as possible, you need the biology. And you need complex biology and you need healthy biology. And that's what I'm aiming for. So yeah, that's that's what we're doing. Um, so we're we're taking on the composting system, which is what we're um, demonstrating out here. So it's a farm scale composting system. We're running windrows in the barn, in the cattle barn. So when the cattle aren't there, the suckler cows come in over winter for about six weeks, and we put them down on straw and feed them hay. So that's sort of the baseline of the, the basis for the compost. And then we've got the inputs as well. So we're creating the compost. And then thinking about the application, I've worked on organic farms before where we're applying farmyard manure and you've got a big muck spreader and you're putting on sort of eight to 10 tonne per acre. And it just, the energy required to do that does not make sense to me. So. I, w I sort of looked at it, we can make compost in the field. So, you know, if you look behind you, you've got this amazing cover crop. You've got nitrogen and you've got carbon already growing in there. So then you graze that with your cattle, you run that over, you trample it, and then we apply this compost as a tea, basically. And so I've been playing around with this and, and researching it and, and trying to get a figure on how much actual physical compost we actually need in order for it to, to work. And what I've found is, is that it's only, yeah, like I said, it's about two litres of actual physical compost. So one of those bags per hectare um, per application. And the way we go about it is we put about, so it's a thousand litre tank, it's a conical tank, and it's just got a simple air blower and it bubbles air up from underneath and creates that aeration, that bubbling effect. And that the, the the oxygen is really, really important because it's all um, aerobic uh, biology. And then you basically put the compost into that. You can use a tea bag or you can sieve it slightly. And then you put a, f a food source into that. And it depends on where the soil is balanced. So I don't know if you know Elaine Ingham's work where uh, the balance of the soil, so grassland is about one-to-one -one fungal bacterial dominance. Um, a historic arable ground that's had a lot of nitrogen is probably very bacterial dominant. A grassland that hasn't been grazed for a long time is probably very fungal dominant. So you can tweak the brew depending on what the soil is doing at the time. So we're playing around with feed sources. So certain feed sources will encourage certain biology. So something like um, lucerne pellets, for example, or bran flour encourages a lot of fungal um, proliferation or you could go like a simple molasses thing which would probably encourage a lot of uh, bacteria and so we're trying to create real complexity because it's about diversity and about complexity and then from that brew so that's about a 900 litre brew we brew that for 24 hours 
and then we dilute that at 10 to 1. So you take sort of 80 litres out of that, put it into an IBC, and, and then we're applying that really simply with a, um, it's basically a Honda fl flood pump. Uh, we've got quite a specific nozzle, which I've imported from New Zealand. Uh, because the, the nozzle is really, really important because if you're putting it through a conventional sprayer, you're damaging the biology, the, the, you're losing a lot of that complexity. So it's quite important in, in the application process. And yeah, we've, we've could you do about three hectares per tank load. Um, so that's the nozzle. Uh, this was developed by a guy in New Zealand who's been doing this for quite some time and it's 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 yeah it's about avoiding that di um, damage to the biology. It's low pressure, high volume, and you can also put other biostimulants in there. You can put small seeds in there if you want to put clovers in at the same time. Put plantain in there at the same time. You can mix all sorts in there. Put humates in, uh, seaweed, all that sort of stuff in with the with the compost, and spray it on. Um, we've been playing around with uh, what's called bio-priming, where we are inoculating the seeds prior to planting. So instead of coating the seed with a fungicide, which is ridiculous, uh, we're coating it with biology. Because essentially a seed has its own biology within it. But if we want to encourage that connection with the biology within the soil, we want to coat that seed with positive biology. So that's when it's kind of placed in the soil, it's ready to go. And um, you can also soak the seeds in a tea solution. So you basically make the compost tea solution and put the seeds into that solution, soak them, and then dry them out. But it's a little bit more complex. Um, I've just splashed out uh, 300 quid on an old subsoiler. And we're going to try and do some what's called rip and drip, where we dribble the compost tea down the legs of a subsoiler because we've got issues with compaction. When you open it up, the soil, you, you can basically feed the biology into the soil and then when the plant grows it chases that biology down so when you're ripping it's it's um, not closing up and that's about it on that front and this is kind of the result I mean they're very anecdotal and preliminary but this is kind of the results we've seen from the um, bio priming so the nodulation on the peas so we put down a pea barley blend and you can see the nodulation is, is, is far more pronounced on the treated one. The plant looks a lot happier and a lot healthier. And just the root structure is, is, um, is a lot more complex. Um, we've we've kind of teed up with the farm carbon toolkit um, to set up as a demonstration farm. And we are looking at the compost tea application as a tool to achieving net zero. So we're going to be studying this application of compost um, and looking at so uh, carbon sequestration over the next sort of five years. Um, yeah, and that's that's me. I brought my own. <laughs> so I think what I'm going to do first of all is stand up because I can't speak sitting down. I find it very uh, cramping. But I'm going to pick up on a lot of that my talk on. I'm going to pick up a lot of the uh, comments that were, were made there, particularly about poor structure, oxygen, organic carbon, and, and what I would like to do, if my talk turns up, is um, share with you some of the, the new insights that Rothamsted's very old experiments are telling us about what carbon does, what good it does when it gets into soil, and what it does for the soil structure, what it does for the microbial activity. It's there, it's that one, but you're starting at the end. <laughs> Can we start at the beginning? <laughs> That's it, thank you. So, trying to, I guess, in, in many ways, pr present a, a, a scientific explanation for why composts and other forms of organic carbon work when you put them into soil. And of course, being a scientist, I can't say anything in one word if three words would, would really do better. Um, I'm going to introduce a concept, the extended composite phenotype, which um, you're probably thinking, uh, I don't like the sound of that, but I'm going to assure you you're all very familiar with it. If you're familiar with bird's nests, bird's nests are a classic example of an extended composite phenotype. You can probably recognize the bird even from the nest, when it, even if the bird isn't there. The nest is an expression of the bird's genes 
beyond the organism. And the, the theory that I want to show you is, is that soil is actually an expression of the genes in the microbial component of the soil beyond actually the extent, you know, beyond the, the limits of the organic uh, part of the body. So it's really looking at a, a tight coupling between organic carbon inputs, the way that that's processed by microbes, and then the structure that generates feedbacks, feeds back onto the biology and changes the relative abundance of different genes. And so you can manipulate soil in the good direction. We can talk about what a good direction is in a little bit. Uh, I want to start, if you ever think about where soil, soil, sorry, carbon goes when you add it to soil, we need to think about down at the aggregate scale, at pores of 100 microns or less. We now know that a lot of the carbon that enters soil ends up in pore spaces like this. So this is an animation generated from an X-ray computer tomography image of a soil aggregate that was probably about two millimeters in size. The reason these pores are so important and the reason why the carbon in these pores are so important is first of all, at this scale, water is held back against gravity as a soil drains. So a lot of these pores are effectively the water holding capacity of your soil. But the scale is also such that this is where all the microbial activity is going on. So it's microbes and fungi, 100 microns and less, my bacteria usually about 100 microns, sorry, one or two microns. All the activity is going on in these pore spaces. So understanding what carbon does for these pore spaces and controls the microbiology and the function in these spaces is critically important to understanding how we can manage carbon in soil and how we should manage it most effectively in soil. So we know that there's a really strong relationship between the amount of organic carbon in soil and the connections between pores formed very low carbon, there's very little porosity formed in soil. These are from uh, soils at Rothamsted that have been starved of organic carbon for 50 years. So less than 1% carbon, around about two to 20 tons per hectare. Very little porosity in those soils, estimated from, from X-ray computer tomography. As you go to a permanent pasture that's probably been pastured for at least 170 years, 80 tons per hectare, above 4% organic carbon, and you're seeing a much greater amount of porosity there. As we know, each soil has a sa saturation point of organic carbon, and along with that, we can see that there's a saturation of the amount of porosity that is formed. So there's a clear but non-linear, unfortunately, relationship between uh, the amount of organic carbon in soil and the porosity that's formed in it. Now, these are two um, these animations of a couple of aggregates, one from very low carbon, one from very high carbon. And as the, as the animations run through, you'll see the pore space inside becomes apparent as, as yellow. And what you'll notice is, I mean, the graph is very dry, very scientific. This shows very beautifully just the extent to which organic carbon is controlling the amount of porosity in that soil. Very low uh, porosity in this soil, very few connections between those pores, and that's critical, but we'll talk about it, why that's critical in a minute. At the top here, a lot of organic carbon, a lot of pores, and a lot of connectivity between those pores. And we're all biological entities here. I'm sure we'll, we'll agree connectivity is life, and that's just as true of your social media as it is of soil and or or organic and microbial populations in the soil. This third one is actually an arable soil that is tilled every year but has received large amounts of organic matter as farmyard manure for 170 years. And you'll notice that despite tillage every year, that organic carbon has provides sufficient porosity that it looks very di distinctly similar to the permanent pastures that we have on, on Rothamsted soils. So this sort of demonstrates that if you have enough carbon to hand, even if you were to continue tilling your soil, you can generate a structure that is equivalent to a 170-year-old unmanaged pasture. So carbon is a powerful tool with which we can manipulate our soils. Now, the reason it's so important, and the reason connectivity is so important, is that it controls movement of 
Uh, in this case, we're interested in hydraulic conductivity, the movement of oxygen, water, and nutrients dissolved in water. Now, this shows a very nice relationship between our connected porosity and this hydraulic conductivity is modeled, so it's not measured directly from soil, but it's mod modeled based upon the pore networks that I've just shown you in those X-ray computed tomographs. And what's particularly interesting is in the soil that's been starved of carbon for 40 years, very little porosity, very little connected porosity, very little hydraulic conductivity. In arable systems, again, although there's more connected porosity, the hydraulic conductivity is not particularly high because you're there getting more pores, the connectivity is still very low. But you reach a critical point at somewhere between 20 and 30 percent connected porosity where you suddenly get this shift in the hydraulic conductivity. Now this is something we're probably all familiar with. You move to a new town, you start up your own social network, you move to a new uh, business. When you're first there, you know very few people. Your connections are very limited. Suddenly, your connections and the people you are connected to and they're connected to suddenly explodes and you reach what's called a, a connectivity avalanche. And we see this same phenomenon, this sort of critical behavior of systems in all sorts of systems on Earth. And soil is just one of those systems, particularly with respect to the connectivity of pores, which controls how oxygen moves through the system, how water moves through the system, and nutrients associated with that. Now, the reason that's so important is if we model the anoxic pore space in these same three soils, soil that's starved of carbon for 40 or 50 years uh, is, even at field capacity, about 30% anoxic, whereas the permanent pasture at field capacity is only about 5% anoxic. So by controlling the porosity, which you're controlling by adding your organic carbon, you're having far-reaching influences upon the movement of nutrients through the system, oxygen particularly. And of course, oxygen is vitally important for how microbial systems work. The very negative organisms you were talking about, the anaerobic ones, are the ones that create nitrous oxide, hydrogen sulfide, and that nasty compost. And they're doing exactly the same in soil, if you let them. So I've talked about how you can manipulate and control the soil structure and the way nutrients move through, and particularly oxygen move through. But what about the microbes themselves? What's happening to those communities as you change the amount of organic carbon going in? So this is a paper that was published this month, so it's hot off the press. And um, one of the real take-home messages here is that we, can, we are now able to describe, at least get a measure of, the average length of a genome of organisms in soil. And we've now been able to determine that the diet you feed soil is critically important to how many genes microbes store on their genome. So a nice, rich diet from a, a pasture gives us very lar relatively large average genome lengths. What's particularly important is if you feed a very monotonous diet of arable wheat, those genomes lose about 650 genes compared to the equivalent average genome length in a pasture. If you starve the soil of carbon for 50 years in this fallow soil, the loss in the average genome length there is equivalent to about 1,500 genes. So the organisms are losing the capacity to function. So by feeding a rich diet, you are maintaining a large toolbox. And anyone that was at Carl Ritz's talk just across the way a couple of hours ago um, will realize I'm just simply reiterating what he was saying about diversity in soil and its ability to act as a toolbox and provide resilience to the system. So I've shown you that we can manipulate the soil structure. This also demonstrates that we can manipulate the biodiversity directly. And by that, I mean the toolbox that individual organisms are carrying around with them in the soil. But we can also change other things. So if we look at the general traits of these communities, as you might imagine, ectomycorrhizal fungi are very common in grass but a lot less common in arable and bare fallow starved soils. If we look at anaerobic respiration, because of this limited amount of oxygen, nutrient, oxygen movement through poorly connected soils, the ones that have very little carbon, we can see that anaerobic genes coding for anaerobic respiration become more abundant as connectivity between the pores is lost. 
So as that flux of nutrients through the system is locked, as oxygen mo moves more difficultly through the system, the genes controlling anaerobic respiration become more abundant. That's critically important because one of the key processes, key processes that you are all interested in here, is how nitrogen gets to your plants. And in anaerobic systems, a lot of that nitrogen is lost as nitrous oxide by microbial activity because the organism has been forced to adopt anaerobic respiration. So that's key. But also, in a very poorly connected system, we know organisms secrete more enzymes, an inefficient use of nitrogen, and are more mobile. So they use energy to do stuff that isn't about assimilating nutrients and growing. It's about having to cope with poorly connected systems. And actually, there's a lot of parallels here between microbial systems living in very poor environments and humans living in very poor environments. Humans that live in very poor environments do not flourish. They spend most of their time doing very negative activity. Uh, give people very good environments and we flourish. And the microbial community is exactly the same. Uh, and also, what was particularly interesting, if you remove this rich diet from grasslands and move to arable systems and move to bare fallow systems, the fungi community shifts and adopts a more pathogenic nature and starts being pathogenic on plants uh, and, and insects and lichens. So the diet is critically important. Carbon's important from all this structure and the movement of nutrients, but diet is also important. Providing a diverse diet from plant inputs sustains microbial activity, sustains the biodiversity and the resilience, most importantly. So this all wraps up into this concept of an extended composite phenotype, which is a, simp a complicated way of saying inputs into, car into soil in the form of organic carbon create structure by virtue of microbes breaking that down. When it gets to a sp the right sort of molecular size, it absorbs to mineral surfaces. Those minerals co-absorb co to each other, stick to each other, and you start building up structure. It's that structure that forms the right living space, if you do it correctly, in the soil. High throughput of nutrients, high throughput of oxygen. When that happens, that feeds back upon the genes in the microbes that have created that structure. So that genes uh, associated with the assimilation of complex carbohydrates become more abundant if you're forming a good structure. If you're limiting the inputs, then a lot of those genes are lost from the system and other genes become much more abundant, particularly to do with coping with anaerobic environments. So we have this effect of microbes on the structure and then we also have this structure feeding back into the microbial gene component of the soil. And me? That Are you able to summarize? And that is the summary. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It may not have sounded like it, because I could have gone on forever and ever, but that was the summary. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, it was just because we have... Um, a have a link coming in, right? Yeah, a recording coming in from Nicole Masters. Um, and then she's going to be, a, well, we're going to hope that she's available for live questions just after it. Yeah, I mean, she really wanted to, we wanted a direct link, but actually what happened when all of you guys have your phones on and everyone here, it meant that there wasn't enough energy to get Nicole from the middle of America here. But anyway, luckily we did a pre-recording. So yeah, we'll, we'll hear from Nicole and then we're going to go to questions. Is she up now? Okay, no problem. She is sitting in America waiting for questions. So <laughs> please, if some yeah, of you have some about questions, questions, please, <laughs> yeah, please, there she is. Hi, everybody. My name is Nicole Masters. I'm an agroecologist, and I'm joining you from beautiful Montana, USA today. So thanks for having me along. I'm wanting to share with you today just some of the insights in terms of how it is that we see such effectiveness with the use of inputs such as um, vermicast and compost. So join me as we dig down into our soil systems. So as an agroecologist, I work with nearly every sector possible. So if you've got soil, 
then potentially we have worked in this industry before. So anywhere from avocados, running sheep, beef, uh, dairy systems. We work through uh, North America, Australia, and New Zealand. So a huge diverse range of ecotypes that we are working in, which um, makes this for very exciting work, makes it often very challenging. But part of our diagnostics is really thinking about what is it that's a limiting factor in this environment and how is it we can turn soil systems back on. So the root of it all really is our rooting systems. So really encourage producers to dig holes and take a look. What do your root systems look like? Do they have what uh, is technically termed a rhizosheath, but which we call the Rastafarian root systems? This really is the buffer and the interface for plant health and ecosystem function. So one way I want you to think about it is that the plant actually outsources many of its resources outside of its body. So its stomach is actually outside those root systems, um, its healing systems, how it gets nutrition, how it even listens or sees the environment around it, all happens with relationship to microbiology. So think about it in terms of the microbe gut brain, so a little bit like in our own bodies, there's a bi-directional signaling which happens from microbiology to the root to the shoot and back from the shoot to the root to the microbiome. So this signaling and communication network is happening all the time. And those organisms inside that rhizosphere, they stimulate the release of what we call plant secondary metabolites in the roots and in the insides actually of the plants. And so this is a messenger that's happening between plants and microbiology. And that plant then signals back to microbiology, which can actually alter the diversity and the activity of different types of microbes in that soil system. So if we want to have healthy plant performance, just like it is in our own gut system and in our own bodies, 80% of plant health and nutrition is driven by having biological function, having diversity and having very intact and diverse networks. And what's driving all of this is rhizodeposition. So nutrients, uh, materials that have been released by the plant. So that might be root cell material or mucilage actually being shared off the plants, which is feeding and stimulating microbiology. It might be different soluble organic substances. So sugars, amino acids, organic acids, enzymes and enzymes. I'm going to say enzymes twice just because. All right. And uh, things like fatty acids. All right. So there's all of this stuff that's coming out of a plant. Um, you know, and if we're talking about sunlight capture, up to 40% of those sugars could be actually being pumped out that root system to stimulate all of what supports a healthy plant. And part of this process is what we call quorum sensing, which is, um, I basically think about a quorum is you get a certain population of microbiology building until they get to a density or a quorum that then switches on or switches off. And so this can actually regulate gene expression in the plant and can regulate gene expression in the microbiology. So these signals or different types of metabolites or they are chemicals and enzymes of what microbiology used to communicate and coordinate group behavior um, and they can also reach certain thresholds, which is called quorum quenching, where they can switch off those behaviors. This, um, these metabolites or these signals or these proteins are in parts per trillion. So you only need teeny tiny, tiny amounts of these substances to turn microbiology on and off and communicate with the plant. So if you imagine the outside of the cell of a bacteria, there are hundreds of thousands of receptors on every single cell. So that could be a cell in your body as well. And so it's this parts per trillion that's required to induce some kind of response. So these teeny tiny receptors on the outside of those cells, and they're basically waiting for different types of signals to turn on or off or to change different types of gene expression so that a plant could respond to or a microbe could respond to diseases, could respond to changes in temperature, could respond to changes in uh, chemistry um, in that environment. So take a plant that's being attacked by some kind of disease, let's say it's Botrytis. So you've got that on the left hand side as a plant with the presence of um, Botrytis and it's under attack. If it doesn't have a specific type of organism, so in this case it's Trichoderma. So Trichoderma is um, a fungus that can specifically um, eat bad fungi, um, 
whatever that is, <laughs> all right? So without the presence of trichoderma, that plant is gonna come under a disease attack and we're gonna lose production or um, plants are gonna be compromised. In the presence of trichoderma, what happens is the plant signals and in response that trichoderma replies basically to the plant and induces this priming effect of things like your jasmonic acids, your abscisic acids and your salicylic acids, which enhance plant defense. Now that plant doesn't have a disease presence. So this all happens in relationship with beneficial microbiology to enhance that plant's ability to defend itself. And what we've done is we've basically blown that microbial bridge in order for plants to be healthy and defend themselves. So there's different types of things that are gonna disrupt that plant signaling. So it might be stress, so like super hot, super wet. Um, it might be the pesticides, herbicides, soluble fertilizers you've been using. It could be poor nutrition, so low calcium, boron, nitrogen or trace elements. It could be your management. So what have you been doing? You know, has it been cultivation, overgrazing, water logging? These things are all gonna disrupt that plant signal. Um, different types of soil will change the types of signals. And if we have low organic matter, right? So all these different things, which I mean, a lot of these we could just call modern agriculture, disrupts that natural plant signaling process. So how do we restore that gut microbiome? Um, we can stop doing all of those other things. <laughs> we could look at um, how do we build diversity, um, diversity of plant species, um, livestock that we might be running, increasing our grazing recoveries, we could incorporate things like um, compost. Um, I'm a really big fan of vermicompost. So that's my background is really in vermiculture. And how do we get the most biodiverse fungal based vermicast? And this image down on the bottom uh, right is a 90 foot wide drill um, in New South Wales and Australia. And they're actually dripping a uh, vermi liquid. So worm extracts down those drills when they're at seeding. Right, so what are the things that we can do to help restore that soil gut microbiome? So there might be like a prebiotic or a probiotic if we think in terms of human health. So I just want to show this example. Um, Steve Charter is a good friend and client. He runs a Too Lazy Two Ranch in Billings in Montana. Um, super dry landscape here, been practicing holistic grazing management um, since the mid 1980s. Um, and one of the things he's got hooked on is vermicast. So um, using feedlot waste or um, waste from yards, um, straw, manure, all of these kind of materials, some vegetable scraps, um, leaf waste, hay, whatever you can find to actually build some pretty large scale um, vermiculture. So this is only one bed of 10. Um, and what he's found is through um, the application of that to land, we're seeing dramatic increases. So um, we're doing anywhere from one to two pounds of vermicast as an extract per acre. So that's like one to two kilograms a hectare. Um, these are extractors. So this, um, you can see that's kind of got a mesh. So you can actually fill that with vermicast or compost and then take that off as an extract. And then that could be applied as a liquid um, or as a solid, we're using about 30 kilograms per hectare um, down with the drill. So these are the extractors in action. Um, sorry. And uh, you can see those extractors. Um, that's the effect of water and air is actually being blasted through that. And then that liquid is coming through in a through flow system and you see that settling tank there. That liquid will actually settle out and then can be um, extracted off and then used in cropping operations. On this specific operation, they're using it on 45,000 acres. And that is the foundation pretty much of their entire cropping operation. They don't use any nitrogen, phosphorus, um, very little herbicides and compost extract and worm extract is their entire operation and has been for over 20 years. This is what uh, Steve Charter is using to actually apply his worm extracts and he is um, applying at about two and a half thousand acres a year depending on the year and then just spraying that out as a liquid and what's what's really interesting is to see that response is we are seeing um i don't know what happened then 
my machine has gone crazy. Uh, what started as very open ground, despite his great grazing, um, it was very dominated by one specific species, which is crested wheat out here. We started to see a massive increase in the diversity of the plant species and the density of that through this application on top of really good management. Like this doesn't happen without good management, right? Well, you could, you'd spend a lot of money. So you could do it without good management. Um, but yeah, on this this operation, so this is Diane Ian Haggerty's um, place. It's the 45,000 acres. So they're putting a worm extract down with the seed. And in the first year of doing this, they grew a whole lot of, um, I guess, invasive grass species, button grass, kerosene grass, windmill grasses. They don't sound very good, did they? They didn't spray them out. They just left them to grow over summer. What you can see down those rows is the oat crop that's being removed. And in the second year, what they saw was... Um, a native grass, a C4 grass called Ceratia, um, that had not been seen in this area for 60 years. All this is, is the signaling to turn that germination on. All right, so what signal are you sending? Are you sending a signal for pests and diseases or are you sending a signal for nutrition and health, right? It's all about enhancing that soil gut microbiome. So thank you so much. I look forward to the discussions that we're gonna do right now. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Um, so I am gonna try and get her um, on the speaker, just one second here. Um, but first off, I just wanted to, that was a lot of information, amazing information. Um, and I think the overriding message I got, and I don't know what you guys thought, was diversity. Um, that essentially, like, it's the diversity of microbes um, that is actually the, the key to it all. If you have that diversity, if you have all the different types of microbes in there, they're gonna manage it for you. Um, and if you don't, as soon as you come out of the balance of diversity, that's when you start to get problems. And so is it fair to say that what you, know, what you guys are creating really is, um, or your inoculum is that incredibly rich diversity? Um, of microbes, you know, is that how your compost is different from someone who say, or say you go and buy uh, compost made from green waste? Is that is that the key to the difference? Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, it is. It is um, um, diversity and also alive. Um, a lot of the compost that you do buy from the store is um, the the actual microlife is is um, either turned off because it hasn't got the right environment or it's it's not it's been killed. So anyone got a question for, um, for, for Nicole? Sorry, I'm trying to call her. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> okay, so everyone can hear you. You're on a speaker. Can everyone hear? Hi, Nicole. Hi. Can yeah, you, can oh, you hear me? oh, yeah, wow. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions for Nicole at this point? We did prep you to uh, get the questions going. So does anyone have any questions after her, her video? If not, I can come up with some. Okay, do you guys have any questions to start? If not, I can go. Um, oh yeah, okay, we've got one at the back. Yeah, um, we're organic dairy farmers, and we're, we're starting down this journey, and we've got an amount of land with an amount of soil quality. Do you start with a specific soil test Okay, Nicole, so they're da organic dairy farmers and they're just starting out and they have a, you know, certain amount of resources. Is there a, s a test to start with that will help you decide which direction to go in? Did you hear me? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a spade, using a spade to go and look. Yeah. Is that fair? Sorry, this is modern technology being a little bit slow. Um, yeah, and actually, I don't know if you've ever, or you may have come across Nicole's book, um, For the Love of Soil, but she actually details quite a few different ways you can go and look um, and dig holes um, and see for yourself and start to understand your biology for yourself. Um, so I definitely recommend, it's very practical and, uh, and an enlightening read and fun, but you can actually gain quite a lot from reading the book. Um, so definitely recommend that. 
Uh, and you do need to look at Abby's soil mentor yeah. because she has tests on her soil mentor which get you started. Yeah. If you, if you want to understand, sorry, if you want to understand the biology within your soil, so say um, coming out of a conventional arable system, you're probably quite bacterial dominant, you can test that uh, through the soil food web and that will kind of distinguish that bacterial fungal balance and sort of give you an indication of how much biology there is and, and an indication of what type of biology it is as well because you can tweak it either way. Yep. So what's the relationship between the, the science, <coughs> the, the biology of the soil, which we've been talking about, and you know, the science? So you've got, a, you've got a soil test and it's, for example, you know, in sulfur or something. Are you saying that the biology will correct the soil chemistry? What do you think, Andy? Well, that's put me on the spot. <laughs> <coughs> I'd, I'd say we really don't know. Um, my experience of, of soil microbiomes is they adapt to the environment they're in. And, but actually correcting whole nutrient deficiencies is something quite difficult for microbes to do. And certainly we, we know that they will mine certain deficiencies. But sulfur is you know, its not the same as phosphorus, which is... It's relatively well known how organisms access phosphorus. But understanding um, how, ac how they access sulfur in deficiencies is... is I, I guess what I'm doing, I'm saying there's a plea for a lack of research to, uh, to understand how to manipulate these th processes properly. And, Nicole, could I ask you that question? Um, you know, the question was, yeah. are these... Like, are we saying that the microbial... By manipulating the microbial life and complexity in the soil, that it will correct things like low um, sulfur levels, um, will it correct the chemistry by manipulating the biology? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's like seeds are all biologically driven, and that might be organic matter and roots as well in that system, but it takes people a while to get there. So don't think that um, that would be it. it will biology works and all your nutrition works that's something that can take people quite a long time to be able to create that ecosystem so I think that you're just going to pull all your mineral program tomorrow because okay okay but also um, just be wary of your soil test because they're testing for plant available plant like soluble fertility um, so if you go for a soil test to look at your what's the nutrients in your soil go for a total um, soil analysis because a lot of that uh, what they're testing for is actually what's available to the plant and I've got fields at home on a soil test there'll be NPKs of zeros and ones and actually uh, uh, carbon so organic matter of sort of 12 and it's absolutely flying and there is no deficiency so you just it's it is about understanding how the biology works and, and sort of unlocking that and making it more available to the plant as well yeah, and certainly I've seen, like, for example, uh, you know, on Fred Price's farm in Somerset, it took him, like, at least three years before the biology was in good enough condition to sort itself out. So it wasn't just, like, suddenly all of his levels went great as soon as he decided the biology was important. It took time to build that system back. Um, and I think even still, like, eight or nine years on, still seeing great improvements year on year. So it does take time. Um, and it's... <laughs> yeah, correct, well you correct your trace elements yeah. basically to get your soil to function. Sorry. Yeah, you, you balance out your trace elements to get your soil to function because if you do little and often, instead of overwhelming it with fertility by actually uh, looking at the little things that make that biology function, then that will kick start. And, and so instead of looking at plant available stuff and what will make the actual plant grow, you're looking at what makes the biology work in the soil. And that's kind of what Nicole's said as well. It's your diversity of inputs again. Um, yeah. If you're just feeding a monotonous diet that hasn't got much sulfur in, you probably never would achieve that. But a diverse compost that uh, has brassicas as part of that, so you're yeah. bringing sulfur into the system. Oh, it has would a be cover crop as well. Oh, it's a cover crop. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes. I'd like to make a comment in relation to the business of new street availability, etc. Just to remind everybody that the first principle of sustainability is a very simple one to get your head around. And that is, within any one system, a confined system, whether it's your body, or your field, or your farm, if you take more resources out of that system than you replace in the long term, it will run down. So it's all very well for us to be supplying these nutrients, but if you are then removing the system by selling your crops or whatever else, in time, the inputs are not at least matching those. The system is going to run down. So you need to keep an eye on where you're adding very small concentrations um, of components that are influenced in the system. If they're not importing nutrients in some way, then in time you're going to import nutrients. So you've got to keep an eye on that balance as well as the overall, I mean, I completely agree with all the complexity stuff, but nitrogen, if you're taking nitrogen out of that soil system and not putting it back in, in time, maybe not in the same braces, it's going to run down. And in, in ecological terms, the mechanism for that is end fixation. That's, that's much slower than most agronomic circumstances do. So you've got to keep an eye on your, your balances. Um. Nicole, do you have Nicole, do you have any comments on that? So the point from the floor was that um, the you know the microbial diversity is really important in the short term, but that in the longer term, if you aren't replacing the nitrogen, it will deplete over time. So you do have to um, kind of keep an eye on through the tests your nitrogen level, all, all your different levels over time. So nitrogen is the one element I'm the least concerned about. More off is no. So generally, if you have a nitrogen problem, it's because you have a compaction or very bacterially dominated soils. And what we find is as you start to build soil structure, it's 70 above every hectare we applied nitrogen at all because that system has broken down in soil. Just a Zealand comparing regenerative farms to conventional farms and hasn't been published yet, but what they found was that those the crop were <laughs> the same kind of oh. structure and is not sorry Nicole. Sorry Nicole, we're um missing great parts of what you're saying now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 you can't hear me, but have a great event, guys. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> and, and if any of you are interested in how we're making the climate compost, uh, there is a little demonstration about to get going over there by the, um, the old army medic tent. Um, and we are also talking tomorrow again um, in more detail about how we make it. Um, thank you guys for coming and for listening to all of us. Um, and hopefully we get to talk to you sometime in the next two days. Thank you. Thank you.